Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege of sharing with you some thoughts about cardiovascular disease this afternoon and its non-pharmacological prevention. Uh, we cannot deny the value of pharmacological interventions in prevention, but I think it's at our peril that we ignore the potential contribution of the non-pharmacological measures, such as the lifestyle risk factors of smoking, diet, physical inactivity, and the context of their psychosocial environment. Uh, that's relevant both to primary and secondary cardiovascular disease prevention. And I'd like for you, to, you to bear with me for a few minutes whilst I present to you some of the facts and figures behind cardiovascular disease mortality and morbidity to demonstrate the relevance to our practice today. The uh, top of the pile amongst the 10 leading causes of death in the world are cardiovascular diseases, including ischemic heart disease and stroke and then the smaller contribution of hypertension and other more minor contributors. Overall, uh, it's estimated that cardiovascular mortality globally is to be in the order of 17.5 billion each year, contributing about a third of all deaths. And this picture is mirrored in the UK. If we are not more successful in our attempts at prevention, the numbers are likely to be increased by a further third over the next 15 years. Cardiovascular disease mortality does vary across the world and across the UK. We mentioned Brexit earlier. It may have some relevance, it may not, but we'll not discuss that now. Uh, compared to cardiovascular age standardised mortality in England, rates in Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland are higher. There are many possible reasons. But uh, the World Health Organisation in its European region has done a study of non-communicable diseases and it's identifying that they are the major contributor to mortality and morbidity. On top of the pile again comes cardiovascular disease. What's really important is that it's causing almost half of premature mortality. That is, we're losing from society potentially valuable contributions in both economic and social uh, perspectives from a population that should still be economically active. And furthermore, these risks are increased by the use of tobacco, unhealthy diets, physical inactivity and excess alcohol, all of which are preventable causes. The World Health Organization has produced a global status report. It aims to reduce by 25% in 2025 uh, mortality due to these preventable causes. It's interesting to note that it's not until the bottom of the list that drugs and technologies are mentioned. And it's also interesting to note that this report values primary care, primary health care, and states that it and public awareness of risk and associated disease should be heightened. The impact model you may or may not be aware of, it was developed in Liverpool by Simon Capewell and his colleagues. It studies the relative contributions of both risk factors and treatments to cardiovascular disease mortality, and it's been applied in various different countries. Despite what I've said as bad news about mortality so far, there actually have been significant declines in many countries around the world over the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, Northern Ireland has experienced in the two decades following 1987 a 50% fall in mortality, cardiac mortality, uh, resulting in about 3,000 fewer deaths. The application of the impact model has shown that over that period of time some risk factors have actually got worse, some have got better. The uh, prevalence of diabetes, physical inactivity and obesity have increased, giving a plus 14% contrib contribution to mortality, but it's been offset by marked improvements in population blood pressure, smoking and cholesterol that has not been accounted for by the increase in prescribing or use of interventions. This picture attributing about 60% of the risk, at least over 50% of the risk, to changes in risk factors is mirrored in many different countries. But the relative proportion of different risk factors in their terms of their contribution to mortality varies. And just to demonstrate that, I've chosen Italy as a comparative country. Again, the decline in coronary heart disease from 1980 to 2000 has been apportioned less than 50% to therapies more than 50% to changes in risk factors. The contribution proportionately uh, due to falls in blood pressure and cholesterol is similar to Northern Ireland, but in contrast, their fall in smoking prevalence has only been 4% compared to ours of 20%. But 
their physical inactivity improved by 10% and ours worsened by 5%. So we need to be aware, I think, of background population changes and to know what our patients' lifestyle behaviours are if we are to be most effective in the advice we give about prevention. And it's not all good news, because very recently, just in the last month, uh, a paper from the United States has shown that whereas there was a deceleration and acceleration in, in rates of decline of mortality of the order of 4%, this has fallen in the last three years that were measured to less than 1%. And it's mirrored both heart, in heart disease and stroke, but it's not mirrored in cancer. Cancer has stayed relatively static in terms of its decline. This change has been uh, observed both in males, females, and across the ethnic diversity. So I think it's illustrating that we need continued vigilance and innovation. Morbidity is slightly harder to measure than mortality. It depends on the source of data that you look at. If you look at the general household survey, approximately 6% of the population report that they have ever had ischemic heart disease or stroke. And that's not changed greatly over the last decades. If you look at cough and count the various cardiovascular categories, you get about 8% but we recognise there's some double counting amongst that. If, however, you add in blood pressure, hypertension management, you will uh, come to a figure of greater than 20%, indicating that approximately one in five of the population is worthy of some attention to their cardiovascular status. Inpatient episodes in hospital, uh, reporting various interventions and events, report uh, prevalence of, or incidence of um, events rather than individual morbidity. So again, double counting is uh, included. British Heart Foundation data show exponential rise in PCI over the last 15 years, and a steady outing of uh, cardio uh, cardiac bypass operations. Whether this rise is truly a reflection of need or availability of services is a moot point. But prescribing data show, and I know it's quite difficult to see it, that the prescription of digoxin and other positive anotropic drugs has stayed fairly steady over the past 30 years. But the overall prescribing of cardiovascular drugs has increased sixfold. And it's mainly due to increased antihypertensive therapy, antiplatelet therapy, sorry, antiplatelet therapy, and lipid lowering drugs. Really starting in the 1990s, the early 90s, and then with lipid um, prescription really hugely increasing over recent years. Whether this is a reflection of better diagnosis, lower threshold of diagnosis, or more availability of drugs, again, may be a matter to debate, but I think that whatever way you look at it, it indicates that increasing proportions of our population are in need of preventive efforts. But it's important to recognize that there are many contributors to cardiovascular disease events, starting with things that we can't do a lot about, mainly social determinants. But we need to recognise that they do have an imp uh, impact on our behavioural risk factors that in turn can affect metabolic risk factors such as hypertension and obesity and diabetes with consequential events. I'm most familiar with the profile of risk in Northern Ireland. We still smoke uh, approximately 22% of our current population are smokers. But I want to highlight the inequality that there is across the socioeconomic gradient. Approximately 34% in more deprived areas smoke compared to 12% in the least deprived areas. And this picture of social inequality or socioeconomic health inequality is uh, mirrored in terms of obesity, in terms of diet, and in terms of failing to meet physical activity regulations. Of even greater note is that when more attention was paid to detail within the figures of the 2010 to 11 survey, only 4% of the population were reckoned to meet all five lifestyle recommendations in relation to smoking activity, diet, alcohol, and weight, suggesting that there's an iceberg lurking in the shadows of titanic proportions. And we know that there are about 32 million cardiac events, cardiovascular events worldwide, but we reckon there are billions at high cardiovascular risk. So, to do something about this, NICE provide us clear guidance on how we may address smoking cessation. Obviously, it's better if we intervene amongst children and adolescents to stop people starting, but there is a range of uh, 
intervention that is possible from brief interventions through pharmacotherapies, including counselling and including mass media. A colleague recently asked me, what's the um, uh, value of brief interventions? I usually tell my patients to stop smoking and it usually takes less than two seconds, but I'm not sure if it's really having an effect. He was from a discipline that was not general practice, I hasten to add, but I think that he should be a little bit more patient-centred in his approach to this. Uh, brief interventions add between 1 and 3% of uh, improved cessation rate on top of self on, not unsupported self-quit rates. They can improve the more interest we take in our patients and the better we tailor our advice to their needs. The five A's is a good uh, template, I think, to follow, asking the patient about their habit, advising them, assessing the readiness to change, and assisting by appropriate uh, support services, but not forgetting to arrange a review for them. Background support can be provided by legislation. In this instance, Northern Ireland led the way, but England followed in 2007, and they monitored their admissions for cardiovascular uh, events. The rate of emergency admissions for myocardial infarction in the years subsequent to the introduction of this legislation fell by 2.5%. Legislation is more debatable in relation to diet. Uh, it's very topical at the minute, but the general advice would be that we suggest our patients and the population at large should follow a Mediterranean type diet, um, improving their fruit and vegetable intake, focusing on their whole grain uh, consumption, oily fish, lean meat and low fat overall minimising their content of sugar and salt. It's worthwhile assessing people's eating habits. Do they eat in front of the television? Do they eat late at night? Do they have long fasts? Some of my patients I know have a single meal in the day, and that's a Chinese at midnight. Um, it's good to ask about family support. Are they the person who's responsible for the cooking, or are they reliant on other people? Either way has an influence on how likely they are to achieve successful dietary change. It's good also to tell them about their BMI because that may prompt uh, their ideas about their need to change and we shouldn't ignore the potential value that comes from commercial weight loss organisations. The Healthy Eating Guidelines production of this uh, Eat Well plate is a very useful guide generally to suggest that a third of your plate should be covered by fruit and vegetables, a third by starchy foods and then the other third comprising a mixture of protein and low fat content. Thomas Allenson, you may or may not be aware of, was a doctor and he was the founder of the factory that produces Allenson bread that is still available today in the shops. You may or may not be aware that he was struck off the medical register in 1894. <laughs> His life history was that he was born in the mid-1800s, became a doctor aged 21, established practice in London, developed an interest in nutrition, believed that a healthy diet was uh, equating to a healthy body, because if you cured constipation by improving your whole grain consumption, you could also remove its attendant evils. He purchased a stone grinding flour mill, he put into practice his firm beliefs, and he opened a bakery to encourage wholemeal and diets. Countering the tradition at that time that was changing to a white bread culture being the thing to do, um, countering an idea that tonics of the day that were uh, often containing large proportions of opiates were good for your health, uh, countering an idea that smoking could cause cancer. He was thought to have very radical ideas and he was rewarded for his efforts, as I said, by being struck off. But more than uh, food availability, there are many other determinants of diet. Our level of hunger, our uh, awareness of cost, our access to particular foods can all influence our food choice. And that's further influenced sometimes by who we're with, or where we are, and by our mood. And this really just serves to say it's a very complex pathway. But it's undeniable that there have been changes in portion sizes over recent years. What was a steak and kidney pie uh, for an individual in 1993 has increased both in size and in calories by 50%. A slice of white bread has increased in size, in weight and in calories by 11%. And a ready-made meal of chicken curry and rice, just for instance, from a frozen uh, prep preparation, has increased also by 50%. And to carry it forwards into a regular drink, it has increased sixfold, and your hamburger and fries has tripled in size. 
So I think something more needs to be done, either in reducing our food intake or increasing our physical activity. How much should we take? Recent guidelines have given us a lot more flexibility than had been in the past. Whereby we've said we've got to have 150 minutes, it's got to be 30 minutes a day for five days. There's a lot more flexibility now in how you may build that up to have positive health benefits. And it's been shown that bouts of 10 minutes or, or more are worthwhile. It's worth noting that the best bang for your buck, the best gain is actually getting people who are not at all active to become a little bit active. That is a major increase in actually reducing cardiovascular risk. It's also worth noting that this advice applies to patients with cardiovascular disease. So that after a cardiac event, as soon as your patient's stable, you can encourage them to aim towards achieving these levels, just being restricted by their limitation of symptoms without any danger. The London bus serves to remind us that this was the research site, if you like, for the first evidence that provided evidence of physical activity and its health benefits. The observations were conducted by Jerry Morris in uh, the 1949. He died, his obituary appeared in the New York Times in 2009. He lived to the age of 99 and a half. He was reported to, almost every day, still to his late years, take regular physical activity. Perhaps evidence of what he believed. Uh, there have been further meta-analysis since that have actually promoted that view, but his initial studies were conducted uh, both amongst bus drivers and conductors and postmen and clerical officers. In both work settings, those who were more active, the conductors and the postmen, had a markedly significant reduced risk of heart attack. This slide compares for patients with cardiovascular disease the relative influence of exercise and drug interventions. And the effects are pretty equivocal except for two exceptions. For stroke rehabilitation, exercise wins hands down from any prescription of drugs. In the case of uh, heart disease, for heart failure, diuretics win hands down against other medications and exercise. If there was one prescription that could prevent and treat dozens of diseases, we'd all be getting out our running shoes if we really believed it. So why are we not more successful in changing population habits? Well, um, Mitke's behaviour change wheel shows some reasons for this. It provides a good framework, I think, for explanations. Set in the context of various policy measures and in the context of various interventions, we recognise that individuals' capability, opportunity and motivation are core, and those themselves are influenced by various other factors. Motivation. We're in Ireland, so I thought I'd take a lesson from W.B. Yeats, who lived in the beautiful Sligo countryside. His advice was, in trying to impart education and knowledge, to think like a wise man, but communicate in the language of the people. In other words, when we're telling to people, whoever our audience is, we should recognise what their language is. If we're talking to patients with limited literacy levels, with different understanding than ourselves, and particular perceptions of the disease context, we need to take account of that in what we tell. And we should remember that we're aiming to fill a pail, not fill a pail rather, but to light a fire. We don't want to reach saturation and achieve apathy. We do want to stimulate interest that's going to be ongoing through a person's life. What are potential beliefs and perceptions of our patients with uh, heart disease of their illness and treatment? Well, one study we conducted a few years ago showed uh, in the terms of its qualitative side that many people believed the outcome of having cardiovascular disease was inevitable. When it's your time, you'll go anyway. It doesn't matter what you do in between. They've also got a perception, many, who uh, think that illness is not threatening because I've survived, I've overcome, and I'm not too bad. They've also uh, beliefs about medication. Some people don't uh, think a lot of it, but others do really, really rely on it, and they think the tablets will control all of the risks. They can think of their coronary heart disease as an isolated event. They may have had their PCI with relatively little duration of symptoms, so they're better they don't recognise that there's underlying cardiovascular damage to be remedied still to prevent further morbidity. And what about exercise? They don't really need to take any because they wash the dishes and they do wee bits in the garden and they go to the shops. And 
part of the reason for that perception is that they have uh, taken on board health professionals' messages, that they don't believe that lifestyle risk is important, and they take on board both implicit and explicit cues. So just a word of caution. Remember too that support for life, healthy lifestyles doesn't just come from what's happening in the consulting room. Social contexts are very influential on our behaviours. And we may or may not really think that our friends are there to support us. They may have negative influences. This man said, I would do the early morning swim, but the wife isn't keen, so I just lie on in bed. Uh, another had a friend who was a great baker and had lovely pavlovas and beautiful cream cakes, and she was just so kind to her and said, do you have another piece of cake? That's not uncommon in our Irish context of hospitality. Cultural norms also can discourage. Another man said, your mates used to tease you. He was teased, his resilience in smoking cessation was tested by his mates throwing cigarette butts at him and making fun of him eating sardines at lunchtime. Another person said, well, I have a grandchild and I want to be her friend, so we'll have chips and then we'll have chocolate. Perceived dependency can facilitate change. Uh, people are often more considerate of their dog's health than their own. So whatever the weather, they'll take the dog out for a walk, but if they didn't have the dog, they wouldn't. Uh, they also have a perceived dependency on health professionals. So if the health professional has given them time and taken a real interest in them, they don't want to let them down, so they will adhere to recommendations. And to remember also that enjoyment encourages. If we can help our patients to identify what they like about healthy living, uh, such as going for the walk in the park and hearing the gossip, or enjoying sharing fruit, then that will encourage that behaviour to be maintained. Sedentary behaviour has been identified as an individual and separate concept and an individual risk factor for coronary heart disease. Too much sitting is a danger, as well as too little physical activity. The workplace is a common scene for this to be propagated. And again, a lot is due to social context. There's often a perceived pressure on people at work to sit with computers because then they're working. If they're not sitting, people don't think they're working. A standing desk suggests that maybe that person has um, disturbed thoughts or uh, disturbed concentration. Uh, some people say they have a preferred time for physical activity. They'd rather do their work now and go and have their uh, physical activity later. But that really doesn't get out of the idea that we shouldn't be sitting stationary for six to eight hours at a time, because that's building up risk on the other side. Some people say we don't want to go out for a, a walk at lunchtime and come back looking sweaty and dishevelled. Uh, other people say there's nothing to encourage us to move from my desk, so just sit. And even worse than that, sometimes sit at lunchtime because they'll eat their lunch at their desk and they'll look at the internet for their relaxation. But there are some facilitators that have been identified, such as the workplace providing a purpose to move. In Queen's, we have recently uh, been given communal printers, so we've not been allowed to have printers on our desks. So we've got to move and interact. That is happening in other places, I know too. Uh, but peer support and employer endorsement, recognising that productivity doesn't fall from people being more active, is necessary. Knowing about patients' physical activity in their workplace helps us to give realistic advice. But we know that GPs are not good at giving advice about physical activity, often because they feel a lack of confidence in the facts or a lack of confidence in knowing how to advise patients to put the advice into practice. So in uh, Belfast, we have conducted an experiment, uh, a study with fourth year medical students in their primary care module placement. We gave them pedometers and we helped an intervention group to set their goals, monitor their performance and give them feedback. And we found that they did indeed increase their physical activity based on step counts per day compared to a control group who weren't given this intervention. And furthermore, they said that they had increased confidence. Obviously, we couldn't just test how they would deliver it, but they did feel more confident in delivering advice to patients. We also uh, did another study previously of, of doctors in training. And here we identified that compared to hospital, the doctors in training were uh, much more active than those in general practice. A cautionary note to those of us, us who sit behind a consulting desk or beside a consulting desk in the surgery. And it wasn't just in volume of activity that they were more active, it was also in their rate of activity. There was a significant difference. Food for thought. 
Our use of the pedometer has increased our uh, visibility, if you like, and our collaboration with colleagues in Belfast, both in public health, in hospital settings with cardiac rehabilitation, and in general practice. In general practice, we've been producing evidence about the value of lifestyle interventions for uh, over 20 years. David Wood and Anne-Louise Kinmouth in 1994 published their family heart study, concluding that a screening policy cannot be justified. And what's changed? Again, there seems to be a little mismatch between the provision of evidence and the implementation of policy today. We provided evidence in our study of uh, health promotion for patients with angina uh, in 1994. We find benefits for physical function, well-being, diet, physical activity, and mortality at the end of our two-year intervention. But that was largely ignored, and in fact, the BMJ said it was dangerous to highlight this fact of potential impact on mortality. But Neil Campbell kindly uh, replicated the study in uh, a later year and showed similar evidence. So, uh, in 1999, Fiona Bradley, whom some of you may remember as an inspiring uh, GP academic researcher who died somewhat prematurely, which is a great loss to our community, uh, co-authored with me a paper uh, to say, suggesting that there was time for a systematic approach to be adopted to secondary prevention. Hitherto, there had been no structured review set a plan in general practice whatsoever, and in fact, many GPs were a bit sceptical that this could have any beneficial impact. More recently, Adele Murphy and colleagues have produced a larger meta-analysis of studies. There's actually five included in the analysis, but in relation to mortality, there were four studies that provided data. And the overall impact is significant for reduction in overall mortality and in cardiac mortality. In terms of wider lifestyle interventions, whereas the previous review concentrated on organizational interventions in primary care, this looked at wider lifestyle interventions in primary care and the community and again showed a positive impact on reducing cardiovascular mortality. And both of those studies were linked to our landmark sphere study in general practice, which was the largest uh, pharmaceutical, non-pharmaceutical trial in Ireland. It was led by Andrew Murphy, who's here in the audience today, and we aim to improve both processes of care and objective clinical outcomes for patients with heart disease. Our intervention showed to, failed to show an overall effect, but did show a reduction in hospital admissions over an 18-month period. We weren't entirely clear of the, of the explanation for that. Perhaps the lack of intervention effect was because our intervention wasn't implemented as intensely as we had hoped, because we asked that the practice staff would implement it rather than researchers, because we wanted to know what would be likely to happen in routine practice rather than in a more sterile atmosphere. It may have been that there was better background awareness of the maintenance and management of cardiovascular risk, or it may have been that we had reached a ceiling effect and it wasn't possible to improve further by these types of interventions what the level of risk would be. But we did see some differences between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Northern Ireland was better at recording status of health risk factors and in, uh, in managing them, significantly so. The difficulty was that the Republic was better in terms of their patients' adherence to healthy diets, exercise recommendations, and they had a better quality of life. Perhaps a word of caution uh, that the COF uh, change designers might take on board uh, increasing patient-centered focus. The team of the SPHERE study uh, remains alive and well today. <laughs> uh, we published our six-year follow-up study recently, and we showed really that, or concluded really, that we need to keep sustaining activity in relation to interventions in order to achieve maintained effects. We had a multidisciplinary input from GPs, uh, as you see Susan and Andrew, to uh, nurses, to economists, to qualitative researchers, to nursing, and to health economic and uh, statistical expertise. We also concluded that we need to keep evaluating management of cardiovascular disease and its prevention in the community. And I think that's illustrated by Chris Salisbury's recent paper where he's showing the potential benefits of telehealth in managing patients without direct face-to-face -face contact. 
and without potentially the involvement of health professionals. I'm involved in a study in Belfast, uh, the Park study, physical activity, rejuvenating Con's water. A relatively socioeconomically deprived area of East Belfast, which includes the shipyard where the Titanic was built and launched. Uh, the aim is to improve access and use of this green area, green space, to ultimately improve physical activity. The uh, changes, the design, the building has been funded by the big lottery. But we're very happy to report that our public health agency and the NPRI, the National Prevention Research Initiative, has funded its evaluation. I think a lot of problems have come from community and indeed general practice initiatives and interventions that have not been properly evaluated. So people can pick holes in them and say, so what? Uh, one of the major uh, elements of success in the local change has been John Kyle, who's a local GP, a leading member of the community who really gets involved. And I think that's again uh, a word of a take home message for us as GPs, for all health, primary healthcare professionals, to get involved with the community, to be seen, to practice what we preach. Let me just give you a quick flick through history. Services of wealth in Ireland have in the past been largely reliant on the flax flower, which uh, produces a plant that has gone through scutching in the water powered mill to spinning in the home and in the factory, to producing a braid or a thread, which ultimately ends up in high quality stores in fine linen, tablecloths and napkins. Why is that relevant? Well, the mills, the, the factories that produce such stuff or produced because really the industry has died, uh, in places like Bestbrook and Zion Mills, where uh, the mill owners were very aware that the health of their workers was key to their productivity. So they built houses in the locality so that their workers could run home at lunchtime to get their lunch and come back again. But they remembered that not all could do so. So for those who couldn't, and for bachelors and for visitors, they provided canteens. Uh, they also built churches and schools. And furthermore, they recognized the need for physical activity and they uh, had various sports teams. This is one illustration of a, a connected cricket team. And this is my father-in-law. After my own father died in a cupboard, I found a fate being advertised, a garden fate. What's the recognition of that? It was a local GP who was a JP in Newton Hamilton, about 60 miles from here, who collaborated with my father, who was a local minister, to plan events that would include physical activity for all sectors of the population walking, cycling, running. And furthermore, they invited people to come in their thousands. So it's not new. But new is, in terms of European guidelines, for the first time, the, these guidelines have, in the last month, been published, updated, to support the combination of communicating with individuals and background support from populations. Population-based strategies are seen to have relevance. As is the need for multi-sector collaboration, and evidence for a continued support to be needed across people's lifestyles throughout their life course. Uh, it is Shakespeare's centenary. Uh, we should give credit to Falstaff for recognising that obesity was connected with frailty. We hope we might be able to get a better advice that he had available then. But my closing slide is that of the AUDGP, which was the forerunner of the SAPC in Belfast 35 years ago. Professor Erwin was our leader. He was the first GP uh, professor in, in Belfast and the fifth in the UK. And you might pick out people like Martin Rowlands, uh, Tom O'Dowd, Bill Shannon, Philip Riley, and myself. And there's probably others in the audience that I may not recognize there. Our numbers and our breadth of expertise in academic primary care have increased greatly since those days when there were about 50 present. And I hope that in future years there will be widespread collaboration from all sectors of uh, disciplines and disciplines uh, in promoting cardiovascular prevention in future years. Thank you.
you very much, Mark. Gosh, I nearly got so distracted by your talk that I forgot to come up and coordinate the questions. There's two standing mics, so if you'd like to ask a question, if you could come up to the, to the mics, and perhaps you might even need to do queuing if you want to make it fair so that uh, if anyone does have any questions, we try and get them all covered. While people are moving into position, I'm... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, Roger British Jones, yeah. editor of the British Journal of General Practice. Thanks very much, Margaret. That was really excellent and uh, fascinating. You touched briefly on fatalism, and it made me think of the work that Nigel Stott and Rosine Pill did on the health beliefs of working-class women in South Wales and the emergence of locus of control theory. Do you think that widening health inequalities are associated with a widening gap in terms of agency so that there's an increasing level of fatalism and acceptance of external forces amongst people in lower socioeconomic groups who are particularly prone to the problems that you've been describing? And if so, what do you think we can do about that? That's an interesting question. Uh, the quick answer is probably no. I, I, I don't think that there's a huge change. Um, I think a lot of it is in individual and in family experiences. I can think of a patient that I've had uh, a couple of years ago whose two brothers, father, uncle, all died early in their 40s with heart attacks. Her own cardiovascular risk was high, but she had this fatalistic attitude. She somehow didn't identify it with it, but then her sister uh, died, who was a year younger than her, and she came back to me in the surgery. She'd, she'd refused to get involved in any preventive aspects. And then when it was starting to hit home, when it was really, really becoming personal, she wanted to engage in prevention. Um, one of the studies that we did in Belfast, said, where we were trying to get people to tell us how we could improve our healthcare messages to them, our health promotion messages, the guy said, it doesn't matter what you tell us. If we believe that it's valuable, we'll make sure our neighbours and our friends know about it. So I don't think that the widening inequality gap really has an impact. I, I do think it's still uh, there. I mean, I have no evidence for what I'm saying. It's purely, purely anecdotal and personal thought. Thank you for your very elegant talk. Uh, could I just play devil's advocate for a minute and hear your response? So uh, given the limited effectiveness of uh, behaviour change for environmentally cued habitual behaviours in primary care, and given what you said about the mill owners, and there are similar examples of the Quakers like Lever and Cadbury in England, um, that actually if we want to do something about cardiovascular disease, we need to shift population distributions of diet, physical activity, salt consumption, etc., etc., and that the current pressures on general practice mean that that should be a societal government and public health issue and we should focus on prescribing to the sick. I totally concur with your argument actually <laughs> and, and I, that's why I think there's a need for the combined approach. I don't think it's the GP's role or indeed the practice nurse's role necessarily to actually do all of this advice, give all of this uh, individual counselling and tailor um, offers of support. I do think we should signpost if you like and I very strongly believe that the public support, the community perspective and culture is all important to helping patients to change their risk factors. Thank you. There's another question coming now. Just, oh, sorry, no. <laughs> Can I just ask one a question as well while people are thinking? One of the things that fascinates me about your very early randomised control trial was that really, I mean, you recruited 600 people. I was asking you last night how much it cost compared to what a trial of that size would cost now. Um, things have changed so dramatically in terms of how much we have all these feasibility and pilot studies before we move on to the large definitive randomised trials. Can I just get your opinion on whether you might think we could have gone too far? Is that possible? Okay. Um, well, our, our initial study was funded by the MRC to the tune of 100,000. Um, and we got, I think it was 10,000 for a follow-up study after five years. Um, I know that many applications today are very much staged in terms of feasibility, pilot and main trial. 
I think one of the difficulties in uh, applying evidence to practice and policy is the time delay. Um, this collaborative work that I have been more engaged in lately is really showing me how uh, policy is influenced not by evidence but by events and I think one of the dangers of our staged research work is that we are delaying the provision of something that's going to be really, really relevant to policy and we may miss out because as I said earlier, secular changes occur, societal changes happen and those all influence how we treat our patients. Andrew Murphy, an older looking Andrew Murphy, unfortunately, uh, from that. Uh, before, uh, my question links on to what you've just said about public, uh, policy and action, but just personally, I would just like to pay tribute to the work that Margaret has done on the island of Ireland. She's been a real beacon for academic general practice uh, throughout the island of Ireland, and certainly wish her every best wish in her retirement. Thank you. That's only his opener. <laughs> so, uh, to balance that, uh, good wishes. Uh, no, I mean, Capel's work was, was repeated in the Republic of Ireland, and we've had exactly the same uh, thing, the huge emphasis uh, on um, uh, preventive therapies and, and their benefit. And Hannah McGee, the Dean of the Medical School, uh, who uh, kindly opened this conference, was chair of a cardiovascular action committee, of which there are 211 recommendations to improve cardiovascular health in Ireland. Two-thirds of those referred to general practice. And yet the funding model did not follow that. Uh, it was largely based about, around expensive interventions, which Capewell suggests have li limited effic efficacy. L looking back on the work that you've done, I mean, those arguments are not new to you. They've been made for many years. Why is it that over that period of time in so many different jurisdictions, the same results seem to ha happen, that even with a, an evidence ba base, however imperfect it may be, we seem to be not able to influence the policymakers to make investments uh, based on the evidence that you produced? Um, the answer that I give to that might be dangerous. <laughs> it, I mean, it, it is, it, it, it's amazing to look back at initiatives that have taken place from the early 80s that I've been aware of, and really so little has changed uh, today. We're saying, that I, I am retiring soon and I've been starting to clear up stuff, and I've been looking at documents that were produced in 1980, and the new document produced today is almost like a rehash, slightly rewording. Uh, so that I feel that the influence of medicine in society has actually diminished. I feel probably that industry has won, if you like, in terms of influence, in terms of changing what is the norm amongst society and culture. Just like Thomas Allison struggled to change the white bread culture, I think we struggle today to change other perspectives. But I'm not giving up hope. I do think that better work between individuals and population initiatives and strategies will result in a healthier population. Thank you. That sounds like that's a very positive note, I think, for us to finish up on. So thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you.